So, continuing these talks on uh, the four foundations of mindfulness. It could also, the word foundation, it can also mean the four applications of mindfulness, the four areas of applying or developing mindfulness, developing awareness. And the second foundation is uh, Vedana, Vedana in Pali, V-E-D-A-N-A. And it's, um, it's a word which more, most generally just means feeling. Uh, it, could, it could also mean ex- in ex- experiencing. It could also mean knowing. It has to do with how we, the present moment experience that we have, how it's felt, how it's known, how it's experienced in its directness, in its immediacy, before interpretations and stories we make about it. And of course, we have many feelings like this. And the Buddha, uh, and Vedana refers to all of them, and there's many different kinds of feelings for sure. But in the practice of mindfulness, the Buddha points out that there are three fundamental feelings, that uh, all feelings have these qualities, these characteristics. And um, and, uh, it's the And to notice how feelings can be pleasant, how feelings can be unpleasant, and how feelings can be neither pleasant nor unpleasant. And um, so sometimes people in in, uh, the Vipassana world will say Vedana means pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. But it's uh, not really quite right. It's Vedana is feelings more generally. And then we focus on how feelings are pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And the reason for that is that feelings, these pleasant and unpleasant, um, is very much the trigger for uh, being for or against, for wanting or pushing away or aversion. And so it kind of works like this, maybe, that um, if someone uh, really really likes candy, and so they just can't stop eating candy, eating lots of candy, and then they get sick, you know, physically sick and bloated and often feel kind of, you know, tired. And after a while, they realize this eating candy doesn't work. So, okay, they stop. It's great. So they start eating cookies instead. And eating lots of cookies, the same thing happens. They say, well, I'll stop eating cookies. Then they eat cake. And then they stop eating cake when they realize how terrible they feel. And then they just start drinking a lot of uh, sugary sodas because, you know, the other things didn't work. Eventually, they discover that what the common denominator is for all these things that they're eating in an addictive way is sugar. Oh, it's sugar that's making me feel so addictive, and it's sugar which is making me feel so bad. So why don't I just stop eating sugar? And, um, and so then that applies to all ways, all things that have sugar in them. And so um, it's, um, uh, it's seeing the common denominator and that applies to all situations of all the cravings for these things that have their root in sugar. So in the same thing, there can be pleasant, all kinds of things can be pleasant and we can have all kinds of relationships with that pleasantness. We can have desires and wanting and addictions um, and uh, and so sometimes we pursue a lot of pleasures, but it's not necessarily that the, the activities we're doing that we're pursuing, we're pursuing the feeling of pleasure, the feeling of comfort, the feeling of joy or exuberance or whatever it might be. Um, but it's, the, it's not really the thing we're doing, it's the pleasantness it provides us, the, the hit of uh, pleasant sensations and hormones and whatever goes on. And the same thing with unpleasant. Um, we can react to unpleasant in ways that are not, uh, not uh, appropriate if we don't understand what it's about. When I was in my 20s, I had, um, for seven years, I had a wheat allergy. And um, 
I'd never heard of wheat allergies before and wasn't well known back then. And, and, um, and so before I'd realized there was a wheat allergy, the eating wheat, I worked at a bakery, so I was, had lots of bread to eat and I was breathing in probably flour. And, um, and uh, so I was, uh, I'd feel really bad. And my way, of, when I felt bad, I wanted to comfort myself. And one of the comfort foods for me was baguettes. And I had lots of uh, access to baguettes. So I'd eat baguettes and I would feel worse. And since I felt bad, I would eat more baguettes. I didn't make the correlation. And at some point, I uh, dawned on me that maybe it's all the wheat I'm eating. And um, I read about it and then I discovered there were allergies and wheat allergies and then I stopped eating it and, um, and I felt better and I didn't believe it so then I would eat a little bit and sure enough I'd feel bad and back and forth for a while. And, um, and so it was the craving for, there again, pleasure again in reaction to feeling unpleasant. I, was, I had to get better, I had to fix it and I was doing the very thing that would make it worse for myself. And, uh, but once I discovered the common denominator, the wheat, then I could find uh, health. So this idea of uh, looking at the pleasant and unpleasant of experience is to look at that common denom- denominator of many different things. And if we can learn to identify how we generally react, respond to what's pleasant, and how we react to what's unpleasant, we get a lot of overview, a lot of wisdom, it kind of like becomes a key for a lot of different areas of our life. We don't have to then do sophisticated analysis of situations. Uh, we just have to realize that, oh, my, I'm reacting because of pleasant and unpleasant. So if you go to a, you know, before COVID, if you go to a crowded party if, or something and you find you're, uh, no one knows you, you don't know anyone there, no one knows you, and everyone's having a good time with each other and you're left out and it's kind of an unpleasant music and you know maybe some of the conversations are unpleasant and maybe there's a lot of smoke in this place, cigarette smoke. And, um, and you realize you really feel off and feel bad and uh, you start analyzing or interpreting it and one, it, one popular way to do that is to blame oneself, you know, I'm so unlikable, no one likes me, and everyone's avoiding me, and that's why I feel so bad. Or these people, you know, I, I need to understand what these people are all about, and, and kind of analyze them and try to understand how I can blame them for something about how I'm feeling. And then it dawns on you, this pleasant and unpleasant things, and you say, oh, wait a minute, the whole situation is just unpleasant. And I don't have to understand exactly why it's unpleasant or what's triggering the unpleasantness in order to not react to the unpleasant. It's just unpleasant. And I know how to be with unpleasant. With unpleasant, you just let it be. Unpleasant, you don't pick it up. You don't push it away. You don't look for blame to self or others. You don't, you don't, you, it's possible just to be aware of it and hold it in a spacious mind, hold it in a relaxed mind. And the same thing with pleasant. You come to a situation that's really, really pleasant, and uh, maybe it's a table full of pastries. I once taught a retreat at a monastery. We possibly we rented a space. Someone rented space in a monastery in Missouri, and there was a meditation hall had a little room on the side, and um, and the meditators kept going into that room back and forth, over and over again, and I had no idea, what was they doing there? And finally I went to check that room, and it was full of pastries. I couldn't believe how much pastry there was, and it seemed like there was a different pastry culture in Missouri back then than it was in California. And the meditators were eating a lot of sweets. So very pleasant. But I wonder how good it was for their meditation. But to see, oh, pleasant, I want that. But then think, I don't, I don't need to do that. I can be free. And discovering freedom in relationship to pleasant and unpleasant is, um, is uh, a wonderful thing. It's freedom. 
to be able to go into an unpleasant place, uncomfortable place, and be comfortable. To be able to go and, ex- and approach something pleasant or experience something pleasant and certainly be comfortable, but comfortable enough that there's no addiction, there's no leaning, no grabbing, no wanting more, it's just allowing it to be. The reason why this is important for meditation is that um, if the mind is operating, chasing after pleasure, wanting pleasure, wanting comfort, reacting to it being there, holding on to it, or pushing away or being upset with unpleasant and trying to fix it and push it away, um, the mind won't settle. And if it won't settle and calm down, you won't discover any freedom. The mind will live in its reactivity. And so to start understanding this common denominator, it's kind of like a little key. It's, a, it's very simple, and sometimes sophisticated people feel it's too simple, um, but simpl- simplicity sometimes is the key. You, can, you come to the common denominator, out of which so much reactivity arises, so many behavior, complicated behavior, f- complicated political philosophies and religious philosophies can have their source in the simple thing. This is pleasant, I want more of it. This is unpleasant, I want it to go away. It's a huge drive of human behavior. And to sit and be quiet and see pleasant and unpleasant our react- reaction to it and to learn to be free, be free of reactivity or be fee- free of picking up and being involved in the reactivity. And eventually just seeing that between ex- pleasant experience There's a gap before reactivity kicks in. And then just in that gap, to just leave the pleasant being the pleasant and leave the unpleasant to be the unpleasant. Then the mind can start discovering peace and freedom, calm, contentment, well-being that is almost, it is not dependent on the things of the world. A kind of inner, deep inner pleasure, deep inner contentment and happiness, which um, is not of the skin, not of the world in a sense of how the world is, but something deep inside, maybe something of the heart. So the second foundations of mindfulness. So you might, you might um, explore this today in the next 24 hours. You might, as you go about your day, uh, you might just notice clearly uh, when something is pleasant and unpleasant and see if it's just that, pleasant and unpleasant, or whether you also um, have um, reactions to it and does it prompt behavior and feelings and all kinds of things. So, thank you so much. So as for an announcements, I have two announcements. One is on Friday, after at 7.45 or so when we finish the, here, uh, if you, uh, I'm going to set up a Zoom room and we can have one of our community meetings we have from time to time. And I'll be sure to use the large Zoom account so there's a room for everyone. And... Um, and that's a time maybe to ask some questions and do Q&A, have some discussion. And also, uh, we'll do one session of uh, breaking you into uh, breakout groups, maybe groups of five, so that you can meet uh, some other people in, this, uh, in our YouTube meditation community. And um, so I'll post the information, the, the Zoom link, on the IMC What's New, uh, maybe on Thursday and on the calendar, IMC, and also in the chat here. At, uh, I'll p- post it at the, on Friday as well, so there'll be different ways of getting it. And um, So that's one announcement. The second announcement is that um, it is a community, and you know, you're, you, I think of all of you on YouTube now and as being part of the IMC community. And um, one of the things I do every year is to send out an end-of-the-year letter uh, to the community, and. It's a kind of it's a fundraising letter, and uh, and so I don't know if that interests any of you. But as part of the community, maybe you're interested in reading the letter and and uh, and so forth. 
So um, that's also on the What's New page on IMC's website, and also I th it's on. I think it's been put on the uh, underneath the video here in, on YouTube on the YouTube kind of description of what we are. There's a link to it as well, and um, so. Thank you for this morning, and I look forward to continuing this series tomorrow. <laughs>